Hi everyone and thanks for joining me. This series of videos is going to cover the changes to the 2020 National Electrical Code and the topic for today's video is Article 392 Cable Trades. So a few changes made here in the 2020 version of the code although nothing really earth-shattering. Maybe some clarifications and also kind of fixing a hole that has been in the code for quite some time that was kind of overlooked. So let's take a peek. 392.10 uses permitted. The permitted uses of cable trays were clarified. So just like anything in chapter three from article 320 on up, we have uses permitted and uses not permitted. But cable tray is a bit unusual and the reason for that is cable tray is not a wiring method. It's just a support mechanism for wiring methods. So here we have a clarification that says cable trays can be used to support wiring methods that contain conductors and cables and are not limited to industrial facilities. So here in the photograph, um, this is a, a pretty interesting example to say the least, uh, a lot of cables here. But the truth of the matter is, you can put cable trays wherever you want. If you want to put cable trays in your house, be my guess. I actually wired a restaurant several years ago that had uh, exposed cable trays going through the dining area. It was uh, very strange, but that's what they wanted. So can I do that? Absolutely, because cable trays are really just like a, a conduit strap or anything else. It's just a support mechanism for wiring methods. However, when I go into 392.10, it also gives me a nice little allowance. It says, first of all, that cable trays and fittings have to be identified for the application. So you, you can't just string a bunch of stuff together and, and call it a cable tray. It doesn't necessarily have to be listed, but it does have to be identified for the application, which means uh, that it's designed as a tray and that it's designed for use as a tray. And then single conductors are allowed in cable trays only as permitted in 392.10b1. And what that is saying is that if you're in a supervised industrial location and you have conductors that are one odd and larger, at least for circuit conductors, one odd and larger, and they're rated for cable tray usage, then you can put individual conductors in your cable tray and run it that way. And that's what we have here in the photograph. This is a supervised industrial location and those are all uh, conductors for power and lighting. So can I do that in a house? No. Can I do that in a commercial building? No, this is only for supervised industrial installations, but you can put the cable tray anywhere. You just can't put individual conductors in the cable tray unless you're a supervised industrial location. 392.30 securing and supporting cable, cable ties used in cable tray applications now have to be a listed product. And this is kind of something that, that when you first read it, it seems to be a little bit overkill. But to be honest, I think this is a, a good change. So it says cables and conductors have to be secured and supported in the tray as follows. Number one, in non-horizontal runs, which of course is what we have here, the cables or conductors have to be secured to the cross members of the tray. Now, there's two main ways that people will do that. Uh, some will prefer to use like a waxed string or twine and they will do a, a particular knot and it's called lacing. And it's a somewhat common application, but a much more common method is to use cable ties. And that's what we have here in the photograph. Now, item two, the cables have to be supported when they enter the raceway easy enough. Number three, where cables leave the cable tray, the distance between the cable tray and other equipment, so from here down to here, is limited to six feet. We can't just run cables, you know, a mile down the, down the, the wall with no support. The conductors or cables have to be secured where they leave the tray, and they have to be protected from physical damage. So really nothing new here. The change here is for the cable ties. Cable ties now have to be listed and they have to be identified for securing and supporting. And this is actually a little bit more complex than it sounds like on its face. So the cable tie has to be a listed product. Easy enough, we know what that means. Uh, here on the package of my cable ties, it says that it's listed. And not only is it listed, but it's listed uh, to Canadian standards and to US standards. So perfect, this is a listed product. That does not mean, however, that it complies with the rest of the sentence because it has to be listed 
and it has to be identified for securing and supporting. So is this cable tie actually identified for securing and supporting? When you look where it says type 2, 21, 2S, and 21S, it's that letter S that gives you the securing and supporting. Cable, tri cable ties, and, and we've all used cable ties, and we can probably all agree with this. Cable ties come in two main flavors. Uh, the kind that are absolute garbage, and just tightening them sometimes will break the cable tie. And look, if you want to use those under your desk or behind your TV, be my guest. But if you're going to be using cable ties for securing and supporting conductors in a cable tray, we need to use the good ones. And the good ones are the ones that have the letter S after them, type 2S or type 21S. So make sure we're using the right cable ties. Uh, by the way, that change uh, correlates with changes made in the 2017 version of the code in uh, Article 348 for flexible metal conduit, 350 for liquid tight, uh, 320 for AC cable, 330 for MC cable, and so forth. So you can pretty much say that if you're using cable ties in a code regulated application, they have to be listed and they need to be identified for securing and supporting. Expansion plates 392.44. Expansion and contraction is now addressed in this article. It tells us that cable trays have to have expansion plates where needed for expansion and contraction. Now, personally, if I've ever seen an expansion plate on a cable tray, I didn't notice it. And the reason that I say that is, I think for the most part, if we had a very long straight run and we had to deal with expansion and contraction, and, and really that would probably be outdoors, uh, you know, due to the changes in the weather. Metal expands and contracts, but certainly not like plastic. So you'd have to have a pretty dramatic uh, change of temperature over a long length. If you have that type of issue, I think what you would normally see is, is just breaking up the cable tray, either changing directions or just having a physical separation and a bonding jumper across it. However, if you wanted to use an expansion plate, uh, that certainly would be allowed as well. But just providing a discontinuity in the tray would be fine too. The last change that they made in the 2020 NEC for cable trays is 392.46. New requirements for a common practice were added. Uh, it's kind of funny how we'll do something for a hundred years and the code actually doesn't talk about it. And I think that's what we have here. Sometimes the, the code just doesn't address what we've been doing and it's kind of uh, goes without saying and everybody does it and it's been fine. And then finally the code catches up. So 392.46 Bush Raceways. A box is not required for conductors or cables entering raceways from a cable tray, but a bushing has to be installed to protect them from abrasion and conductors entering equipment must comply with A or B. All right, so we do not need a box where the conductors or cables enter the raceway. That's what this, that's what this rule states. But I do need to have a bushing that protects them from abrasion. And of course, these bonding bushings, as we all know, have a plastic insert. So this satisfies the rule so far. When we're entering not a raceway, but an enclosure. So going from the tray to the panel board, for example, I now have two ways that I can do that. Bush raceways or openings. Conductors or multi-conductor cables with a non-metallic sheath can enter enclosures through a non-flexible raceway with a bushing and the raceway has to be sealed. All right, so non-flexible raceway, it has the fitting, and then if we were to look inside of it, it would have to have some sort of a sealant to prevent you know, flammable things from getting inside of the cabinet and, and creating a fire. So duct seal, putty, perhaps even expanding foam, although I don't think I would recommend it, it would have to be identified for the conductors, but a little bit hard to get out. So one of those could be used. What the code has really never talked about before, and a practice, again, that's as old as cable tray itself, conductors or non-metallic cables can enter enclosures through flanged openings that are attached to the tray and also to the equipment, such as the panel board cabinet. Protection from abrasion has to be provided, and again, the opening has to be sealed. So you can see here in the photograph where we have this flange that connects to the cable tray. It's bolted to the bottom of the cable tray, 
And if you look closely, you can see how it, it's kind of swept. The, the entrance is, is kind of a sweeping entrance, a flared entrance. So the protection from abrasion uh, really is, is inherent to the design because it's a, it's a smooth opening. And again, it does have to be sealed to prevent any type of foreign material going down that raceway and into the cabinet. So there you have the changes to Article 392 cable tray. Again, not a lot of changes and perhaps nothing that's going to change your life. But boy, if you had the wrong cable ties, for example, throughout the entire cable tray, that would not be much fun. So like a lot of code changes, uh, knowing the rule before you make the installation is key. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.